Praise the Lord. This is the day the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Our Jesus or Muhammad marathon. We're in our second night. I'm your host, Pastor Joseph, and we give God praise for you, dear viewers, watching our program. Call your friends. Let them know that we are live, Mubasher, in the flesh. That's right. And here we are talking about a topic concerning the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, and the false kingdom, if you will, the kingdom of Islam. What is the kingdom of Islam? What is the understanding of, of who rules in Islam and what the rules are? And uh, ultimately, how that turns out in the end times as well as in the eternal state is a very broad topic. And yet there's a lot to be said here. And as we understand, the kingdom of God is very important. Jesus says in John chapter 3, Verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And this is talking about this idea of being born again. So it's, it's very crucial to our Christian faith, the kingdom of God. And now we're also going to be talking about Islam and its understanding of the kingdom. And for uh, this program, we have three wonderful guests with us. I'd like to introduce them now. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Pastor Wissam. Pastor Wissam Khalaf, welcome, dear brother. Sure, thank you so much. Would you uh, take just a moment and tell some of our viewers who might uh, not know you, just a moment, and tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Wissam Khalaf uh, from Lebanon. I came to the United States about 31 years ago, graduated from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And uh, I pastored several churches, but in the meantime, uh, I'm now uh, an evangelist. I travel to different countries around the States, you know, speaking in conferences and uh, in churches. And uh, I live with my wife in California in uh, the area of Monterey. Mm. And I'm very happy to be with you tonight, guys. Thank you so much for inviting me. We're honored and delighted to have you. Thank you, brother. Also, we'd like to welcome back uh, our brother, Pastor Osama Dakduk. Brother Osama, are you with us? Yes. Hello, Brother Joseph. Hello, Brother uh, Wissam. And everybody else who's going to be with us. Uh, it's my joy. It's my uh, honor to be with you in this next hour and a half in this wonderful broadcast. Praise the Lord. And I think uh, all of our viewers, regular viewers, know Brother Osama. Uh, but uh, Brother Osama has a ministry that you can be found at thestraightway.org. Is that correct? Yes, and I'd like also to add, I only have one wife and I only have one son and uh, I travel all over the country uh, to teach about Islam to the Muslims and to the general people of America. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you want to know more about our brother's ministry, feel free to uh, email us and we can uh, direct you to them. Also, we have with us tonight Brother Gary Cobb. Brother Gary, welcome to our program. Good to be with you, Pastor Joseph. Uh, just a quick uh, overview. I'm a father of four, grandfather of 13, and great-grandfather of three. I um, spent most of my uh, career in uh, the corporate world with uh, IBM for many years um, and uh, then started my own business, um, put four kids through college with that until 9-11 caused it to devastating uh, collapse um, because it was involving um, uh, real estate, which took a dramatic hit during that episode. So I, as a Christian, had never studied Islam and needed to understand why do they hate us after 9-11. I spent a, um, literally months and months studying um uh, Islam, and uh, it took me to the Temple Mount in Israel as a flashpoint, uh, a microcosm of the world where the three religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all meet, and uh, still does today. And mm -hmm. so um, there's truth uh, to be found in the Old Testament scriptures and patterns regarding the Temple, and uh, that was the uh, product uh, of my first book, and I just completed a second one uh, called uh, The Last Seal of the King, which is a picture of the kingdom of God as a present reality. 
on earth as Jesus prayed. Praise God. And before the end of our program, I want to make sure you let folks know how uh, they might be able to obtain uh, one of your books. And uh, I look forward to reading it myself. Well, I'd like to open up our subject now uh, with uh, a passage again in the Gospel of John talking about the kingdom of God. Uh, and perhaps when we think of, of the kingdom of Christianity, uh, the kingdom of Christ, and then the kingdom, if you will, of Islam, whether we call it the Ummah or Dar al-Islam or whatever you want to call it. Uh, to me, the most radical difference that pops out immediately is what Jesus Christ said when he was before Pilate. And we can find this in the Gospel of John uh, in the end there. I believe it's in chapter 18. And uh, we come chapter 18 of the Gospel of John, beginning in <clears throat> verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Notice, he says, Are you the king of the Jews? Interesting. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? And now this is very, very important here. Jesus answers, verse 36, My kingdom... Is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servant fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from hence. Pilate therefore saith unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice then of course Pilate asked that famous question what is truth but Jesus clearly affirms that he is in fact the king of the Jews to this end was he born and it is it is his kingdom and it is not a kingdom he says if my kingdom were of the world then would my servants fight and and we just heard brother Gary the average Westerner doesn't know anything about Islam and uh, and they don't understand, especially with 9-11 and these other things, why are they attacking us? Why is there this hatred? Why is there this violence? Uh, but in Christianity, we don't see those who are following Jesus. Now, certainly in Christian history, at least that's which, which is called Christian history, there are Christians who have fought wars, uh, but not according to the precepts of Christ. He says, look, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. When we look at Islam, we see the servants of Muhammad and Allah fighting all day long. We see it today with Hamas and Israel. We saw it with ISIS. We saw it with 9-11. We see it every day around the world in the name of Jihad, in the name of Islam. And so this seems to say, hey, the kingdom of Islam is of this world because the servants of Muhammad and Allah do fight. Now, this is just one clear uh, comparison, contrast. There are many, many more. This very topic of, of violence and, and the idea of how to spread, if you will, the kingdom or the religion to diametrically opposed views. Uh, I'd like to start tonight uh, on this particular topic with Brother Osama. Brother Osama, I know you've gone all over the country uh, teaching about this. What do you have to say on this subject? Well, Brother Joseph, here is the truth. In Jesus' own words here, he came to testify. He came to witness for the truth. The kingdom of Christ is in his teachings. And uh, when we think about the teachings of Muhammad can bring to the teaching of Christ, that make a huge difference. Who is teaching the truth? You're hitting a very important point. In Quran chapter 1, when Muslims pray, in verse 1, I'm not even going into inside the Quran, just the first verse. Chapter 1, verse 1, and they say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. The praise be to Allah, the Lord of the world. Allah, yeah. the God of Muhammad, is the God of this world. This yeah. is his kingdom. And we know for sure from 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that the Holy Spirit is teaching us that the, the, the prince of this world, the king of this world, is the devil, Satan himself. So where we learn about Jesus and the kingdom of Christ, but in the Bible, we will learn about Muhammad and his uh, his uh, state or his uh, ummah or his nation, but 
in the teaching of the Quran and in the teaching of Muhammad in the Hadith and the Sunnah. And in reality, the more we learn about Jesus and his teaching, the more we know for sure that he is telling us the truth. He came to testify for the truth and he shared the truth and the truth and only the truth would set us free. And when we talk about the teaching of Muhammad, it is always the lie. It is always the opposite truth. And that's exactly what I'm hoping to cover tonight as we look at some of the teaching of uh, 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 Jesus and some of the teaching of Muhammad considering different things. I don't know. Do, do we have a minute or do we want to move on to one of my dear brothers? Brother Joseph? Uh, a beginning statement uh, like you just did. And then we're going to come back to you, Brother Osama. Sure, sure. Uh, Pastor Wissam, uh, you, you've heard our introduction and you've heard Brother Osama's comments. Uh, how do you see the, this main uh, view, the, 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 the main gist of this comparison contrast? How, how would you summarize it to, to get people to begin to understand this difference? Yeah, uh, in reality, uh, what I see is that Muslims are trying to imitate Christians mm. and their theology and their expressions. Mm. So uh, by doing that, uh, I can see that they have some inferiority complex. Mm. Because when they compare Islam to Christianity and they compare Muhammad to Christ, they see a huge and big difference. Yes. So instead of uh, clinging to their uh, teachings, in the Quran and the Hadith, they try to take some of the ideas and expressions in the Bible concerning Jesus Christ and apply it to Muhammad, mm. uh, which is uh, unreal. It's not acceptable and it is uh, deceitful. Yes. So what I see is that uh, Muslims are trying to uh, like uh, manage their religion to fit to fit the mold of Christianity so it can be acceptable around the world. Mm. And by mm. doing that, they are, try, try to hide, they are trying to hide uh, their violence and what they are doing, you know, by imposing their religion on so many other people one way or another. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Pastor Wissam. Uh, real quickly, I've heard it said before uh, from a fellow Christian apologist that uh, the Muslim uh, activists or apologists, they try to make Islam look like Christianity and Christianity look like Islam. Do you think that's, <laughs> that's true? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, Brother Gary, uh, we've had the two opening statements from Pastor Osama, Pastor uh, Wissam. And how about yourself? Kind of an overview of what you'd like to get across to our viewers tonight concerning this comparison contrast of the kingdoms? Well, the kingdom of God in a Christian perspective is a much more important topic even than the born again experience, which many of us, most of us receive that teaching at a young age. However, the gospel of the kingdom is the priority that Jesus placed on uh, evangelism. And, and in fact, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added. And, and then he says that um, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached throughout the world and then the end will come. Well, there, he placed a great deal of significance on the gospel of the kingdom more so than the gospel of salvation, which is the starting point in the process of being a Christian. And the one aspect that I found uh, very significant in uh, studying the, the, the word, because I always like to go to the actual words in scripture and cross-reference them, the word kingdom appears 365 times the New King James Version, which is... Uh, coincidental with the number of days in a year. And the, the word salvation occurs less than half of that many times. So obviously there's a priority on it. And Jesus said that we are entitled to know the mysteries of the kingdom. 
And that's what um, my focus of study was. Much of that mystery is unveiled in a study of the Old Testament because even Jesus said, not one jot or tittle will be removed from the law. And I call it the greatest allegory seldom told, Israel. Very good. Thank you, Brother Gary. Well, Brother Osama, we want to return back to you. Uh, and you uh, were talking earlier about uh, you, you had a lot of passages that you were going to go to or, or particular proofs for what you were sharing, the difference. Uh, you mentioned, of course, uh, Surah Al-Fatiha. And uh, you, you are better in Arabic than me, also Pastor Wissam. But uh, really, in the Arabic, Rabb uh, Al-Alameen, this is plural, right? Uh, Allah, he is the, the Lord of the worlds. So it's kind of like uh, Star Wars here. But th there is this, this um, what shall I say? It, it, the kingdom of God in Christianity, as, as Brother Gary is going to be sharing more, as he already intimated, there is a great spiritual uh, reality here. Yeah. Some of our viewers don't know what is the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God cometh not with observation in uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 20. Uh, again, verse 21, neither shall they say low here or low there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So uh, many would agree that the kingdom of God in Christianity, there's an already but not yet aspect. Sure. Already in the sense of, of spiritual, when we're born again, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us. Wherever, mm -hmm. wherever the Holy Spirit has reigned, there's mm -hmm. the kingdom. And mm -hmm. then there is this aspect of if you're a premillennialist, the thousand year reign of Christ, or if not, when uh, the consummation, the second return, with well, the return of Christ, we're going to have the full kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy yeah. will be done. I mean, the Lord's prayer, after all, you know, we talk about Surah Al-Fatiha that the Muslims are praying, what, five times a day. Uh, the Christians, at least once a week, are supposed to pray <laughs> the Lord's prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will Amen. be done on earth as it is in heaven. So yes. back to you, brother, for this fundamental uh, sure. contrast you've been talking sure. about. Well, here's the truth. Uh, Jesus taught us what man gain if he won the whole world and lost his soul, lost his eternity. <laughs> and if, if our dear Muslim friends who are watching us or listening to this podcast can just concentrate with me in the next three minutes here, as I'm going to share with you about the teachings of Muhammad and that's in the Quran, of course, and his Sunnah, and the teaching of Jesus concerning our assurance for our eternity. If, if we Christian believe that the kingdom of Christ is in us, that we, we when we give our heart to the Lord and when we repent of our sin and we become a born again Christian, we know for sure that our names are written in the book of life and we belong to that kingdom for eternity. And we know that for assurance from the word of God. From Jesus' own words in John 3 16. Similar to that, of, I want to compare that to Jesus, uh, Jesus' teaching to Muhammad's teaching concerning the eternity. Here we go. One can know for sure that in Islam, there is no assurance for eternity. Neither Muhammad himself nor any Muslim believer can tell you that when I die, I'm going to be in that kingdom, in that eternity, in that uh, eternal life because. In Islam, no one can know if they will make it to heaven unless they die in jihad. Even Muhammad could not tell if he will make it to heaven or not. I want to quote for you uh, Quran chapter 3 and verse 157. Very powerful verse. Listen to that. And if you are killed or uh, for the sake of Allah or die, then forgiveness from Allah and mercy are better than what? that which they gather, talking about the spoil of war. So here we go, the kingdom of Muhammad, or the state of Muhammad, or the nation of Muhammad, Ummah of Islam, it is for Muslim believers to go and fight. And there are two results can come out of this war. Number one, they win the battle and they go home with the spoils. What is the spoil? The things of this world. If it is animals, or gold, or silver, or even uh, human, uh, females, and uh, a slave, and concubine, or children, as slaves, so this is what Muslim gain in this world. But for eternity, that does not help. The only way for a Muslim can get to the eternity of the paradise of Muhammad, it is for him to be to be slain, to be killed for the sake of Allah. This is not truth. 
These are lies. And I want to compare that to the words of Jesus himself, our Lord and our Savior in John 3, 16, who said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We know for sure as believers in Christ that when we die because we believed in Jesus, because he forgave our sins, as we believe in him, that when we die, for sure we'll have eternal life. Not in Islam. In Islam, you can receive the forgiveness if you are killed. Listen to the word of Allah again. He said, and if you are killed for the sake of Allah or died, then forgiveness from Allah. I'm sorry, Muslim cannot receive forgiveness of Allah and guarantee the eternal paradise of Muhammad unless they die. That's not what we believe in Christianity. So a great difference between Jesus' teaching and uh, and Muhammad teaching concerning the eternal uh, security is in, in Christianity, we know for sure that we are forgiven. We know for sure that when we die, we will get to heaven because Christ paid for our sin. In Islam, well, good luck with that. You go and fight, perform jihad. And if you die, then you receive forgiveness. No, 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 no. That is a lie and there's no truth whatsoever in it. Thank you. And maybe, uh, would you say, Brother Osama, you know, the idea, as I mentioned in Christianity, the kingdom of God is already but not yet. You can enter in by being born again spiritually now, and then one day we'll enter in literally into the presence of the Lord. But it seems like with Islam, the idea of the kingdom, if it's there, is more, you need to enter into Jannah, and the only way to be sure to enter in, into the kingdom sure. is... And, and Pastor Joseph, think about it. Muhammad himself did not yeah. know. Right. I mean, the Quran teaches that every person, when they die, every Muslim believer will go to hell. They yeah. ask the Apostle of Allah, even you, oh, Apostle of Allah, I said, even me, unless Allah cover me with his mercy. So here we go. The leaders of Islam, the prophet of Islam, the best example does not know. But we in Christ know for sure that our sin is forgiven and we're going to be in heaven when we meet our creator. Amen. Well, what I'd like to do is we have about uh, eight minutes before the break, and uh, I'm going to go to Brother Gary Cobb in just a moment, and then perhaps after the break, I want to start with Pastor Wissam. I'd like Brother Gary to give our viewers uh, a better understanding uh, of the kingdom of God and Christianity, as you've mentioned, the connectivity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. What is really... You know, you were talking about how important, how central the kingdom of God is to the Christian faith, to the word of God. If you could uh, elaborate on that uh, for the next several minutes before our break. And then I want Pastor Wissam, after we've educated our audience a bit, because honestly, a lot of Christians, if you ask them, what's the kingdom of God? They may not have a good answer. And then I'd like Pastor Wissam to enter into a discussion of a more recent, apparently a more recent Islamic apologetic device, as uh, Pastor Wissam intimated at the beginning of our program, which is uh, trying to read Muhammad back into the Old Testament and the New and see him as the son of man or as the king of this kingdom. So, uh, Brother Gary, it looks like you have about seven minutes Remember, some of our viewers don't even know what the kingdom of God is from a Christian perspective. So can you help us out, brother? Well, I think we, if we go to 1 Corinthians 15, um, 43 to 48, I, I believe are the, the range of scriptures. It's, it speaks to first the natural, then the spiritual after its kind. And I believe that Israel is that natural aspect of God's plan for maturing believers into a new Jerusalem, as Revelation 21, 22 describe. And that new Jerusalem is patterned after um, the Old Testament. In fact, it says the king is on Mount Zion. Well, Mount Zion in the Old Testament was the palace of King David. That was the sovereign place of rulership. And scripture says that the Davidic kingdom will be everlasting. Well, obviously, um, that is not a literal 
uh, interpretation, which Mount Zion, Zion itself, it says the mountain of the Lord's house is Mount Zion and all nations will flow to it. And is that going to be in literal Israel or is that going to be in a people that God has raised up as mature believers that manifest a new Zion, a new Jerusalem on the earth. And it's interesting in Revelation, it gives the uh, qualifications or the foundations of new Jerusalem. It says there's 12 foundations, the name of the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles in the New Testament. But the gates into New Jerusalem are 12 pearls, each of which have the name of the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's, there's a, and then there's numbers like 144,000 in Revelation that depict overcomers that um, are made into the very likeness of Jesus. Now that's a stretch for much of our theology because we've been taught, many of us, that uh, we're just poor old sinners saved by grace. And becoming like Jesus is a great platitude. But what's the reality? Well, Genesis says we're made in the image of God. And that our purpose is to fulfill that image on the earth. And Paul went to the third heaven and he saw something that he couldn't even describe. And he said, not that I've yet arrived, but I press towards the mark. And I think as believers, that's what we should do is press toward the fullness or maturity that God predestined us to become. And again, when you go to the law, which by the way, Muhammad or the Quran says, we gave Moses the law and Jesus the gospel. And yet it says not one word about the significance of the law. Well, the law was what God told Moses to build a framework, a pattern that would lead us into the presence of the Father, an outer court, a holy place, and a holy of holies. And I believe that pattern is one that, as a church, we've somewhat neglected because we've stayed focused on the outer court of the tabernacle, which is a sacrifice for our salvation, which is a born-again experience, and a baptism. However, entering into the very presence of God is a goal that we should all have, and there's a pattern, and it manifests in a kingdom of, of mature believers in Revelation that become not only sons and daughters of, of God individually, but corporately the spotless bride of Christ. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you, Brother Gary. That's Amen. excellent. And uh, before we go to our break, I'd just like to uh, maybe amplify some of the things I just heard uh, that all of us will be thinking, including our viewers. The idea of the image of God in Christianity upon mankind is largely absent in, in the religion of Islam. The idea that, that we are going to rule and reign with Christ, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, that we uh, will become kings and priests. Uh, there's no room for that in Islam, Muhammad alone. And so uh, there's something here, as you talked about the pattern too, the idea that when we're born again, the, the eternal God comes inside of us through the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, and lives inside of us. And now, if you will, uh, the Old Testament pattern, as you mentioned, is, is being recapitulated in us as the temple of God uh, and his law, no longer in a literal ark, but uh, being written, Jeremiah 31, 31, on our hearts. Uh, mm. We give God praise for this, this wonderful idea. And then, too, as you mentioned in Romans 8, 28 and following, that we are predestined, we've been predestined to become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And in Islam, there, there's nothing comparable 
And so uh, what beautiful thoughts, brother, and the fact that the kingdom of God is, is, is for Christians. Yes, it's going to have a full manifestation one day. As you said, the bride of Christ is going to be a consummation of that marriage. But even now, by his grace, through the blood of the spotless lamb of God, we've been engaged through the earnest of our inheritance, the Holy Spirit of God. What a wonderful truth. What a wonderful Savior. Uh, we invite folks to come and to know more. Let everyone know that after this break, we've got a lot more from Pastor Wissam, Pastor Wissam, and Brother Gary, and we pray from the Holy Spirit of God and His Holy Word to challenge you, encourage you, and glorify our triune God. In Jesus' name, we'll be right back after this short break. Join Trinity Channel Wednesday, May 28th for the next installment of our Jesus or Muhammad Marathon. Join us at 6 p.m. for a special program with host Asad Faraj and guests Anthony Rogers and Dr. Tim Roll. And then join us once again at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a show on women in Christianity versus women in Islam with host Matt Slick and guests Laura Powell, Brother Ahmed Paul, and Dr. Tim Roll. Only on Trinity Channel. ABN and the Trinity Channel are proud to announce the launching of our discipleship program. The service is free and only requires you to sign up on our website to receive the full lesson plan. Just go to one of our websites, Trinity Channel or avnsat.com, and click on the Discipleship tab to be taken to the Discipleship Program page. From there, select your preferred language at the top of the page, and then register with your email, gender, age, study preference, country, and any comments or questions you have. If you're not sure if you would like to sign up for the free Bible course, we offer you to try the first lesson plan with no initial sign up for free. Just click on the free download to the left of the registration box. Start your discipleship training today with ABN's free discipleship course and a special discipleship series coming soon this summer. ABN would also like to announce that we will have a booth open at the You are watching Trinity Channel. Praise the Lord and welcome back to our Jesus or Muhammad Marathon. This is your host, Pastor Joseph, your servant, the servant of the Lord. And I am delighted for you viewers to be watching our program, comparing and contrasting the kingdom of God and Christianity with the kingdom of Islam, if you will. We have our three wonderful guests with us, Pastor Wissam Khalaf, Pastor Osama Dabduk, Brother Gary Cobb, and you, dear viewers. And thank you for your comments you've been sharing with us and encouragements. We're going to continue this uh, important subject right now with Pastor Wissam. Pastor Wissam, in the beginning of the program, you uh, brought forth this idea that Muslims are, are trying to find uh, proof uh, for Islam within the Bible. And, and I really like what you said. This belies an, an inferiority that they have, uh, a need. And, and as, you, as many of our viewers may know or may not know, the, the prophecy uh, in the Bible, uh, there is so much prophecy in the Bible. But in the Quran, you don't see a great deal of prophecy. And, and so it seems that the Muslims are reading Muhammad back into all sorts of passages. And in preparation for this program, Pastor Wissam found yet another place specifically concerning the kingdom that Muslims are looking to find Muhammad. Pastor Wissam, can you share with our audience? Sure. Thank you, Pastor Joseph, for uh, the introduction. And uh, I would like to thank... Uh, uh, my fellow speakers too, because they gave us something very, very good, and uh, it's, it was a blessing for us. Mm. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention something about Islam. Mm. In Islamic history, Islam did not face the challenge that is facing now in the West. 
Mm. You know, when Islam conquered the Middle East and the 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 Southeast, it conquered them. You know, without uh, any like kind of uh, uh, any uh, like any opposition. Mm. They were very powerful, and they tried to. Uh, expand their religion either by the sword or by trade. Yeah. But when they came to the West, especially in Europe and the United States and Canada and in Australia, they faced a highly qualified uh, theologically group of people who are willing to tackle the claims of Islam uh, to its face. So now Islamic scholars are facing something new, which is they cannot take it for granted. So they have to invent some ways that they can face those claims from Christianity. And it seems that the best way they found so far is to claim what the Bible has uh, claimed about Christ and Christianity and apply it to Muhammad and Islam. I'm going to mention a few paragraphs uh, taken from uh, a website that is called islamicweb.com and concerning the kingdom of Islam or the kingdom of God in their uh, point of view. It says here, the first paragraph says, the kingdom of God on earth is a religion, a powerful society of believers in one God equipped with faith and sword to fight for and maintain its existence and absolute independence against the kingdom of darkness, against all those who do not believe that God is one or against those who believe that he has a son, a father or mother, associates and co-equals. So what they are trying to tell us here that Islam has a kingdom like Christianity because in the Christian theology and as brother, uh, you know, uh, God told us that uh, the Bible speaks so many times, hundreds of times about the kingdom of God, mm. which is the rule of God and the hearts of people. And Muslims found that very attractive and it's very close to the mind of Christians in the West. So I trying, they are trying to apply that kingdom to Islam, which is in the Quran and the Hadith never has been mentioned at all. There is no mention about an Islamic kingdom. Mm -hmm. There is a mention of an Islamic ummah, yeah. but not a kingdom. So they are trying to manipulate what the Bible is telling us and claim it to be coming from Islam and from Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Another passage says, what Prophet Jesus announced was, it was Islam that was the kingdom of God, that its prophet Muhammad was the son of man, who was appointed to destroy the beast and to establish the powerful kingdom of the people of the saints of the Most High. Now, that's strange, you know, reading this for the first time. And I've heard about Islamic teaching for a long time. I was born in Lebanon, you know, and I've studied about Islam and I taught Islam in some colleges. It was really uh, surprising to me to see that Muslims are trying to take passages from the Bible and applying those passages to Muhammad, especially when they say that Muhammad is called in the Bible as the son of man. That's really strange and ridiculous at the same time. Because yeah. in the Quran and the Hadith, those two books never mentioned Muhammad as the son of man. Only the Bible in the Old Testament and in the New Testament have mentioned that Christ is the son of man. And mm -hmm. Christ himself called himself over 80 times the Son of Man in the four Gospels. Mm. So to apply the word or the expression Son of Man to Muhammad so he can be the ruler of that kingdom and can inherit that kingdom 
is really abhorrent and it's deceitful and it's not good, you know, for Muslims to take or borrow expressions from the Bible and apply them to Muhammad if they don't have it in the Quran and the Hadith. Mm. Mm. Now it says here another place in the Islamic web, it says the religion of God until Jesus Christ was consigned chiefly to the people of Israel, it was more than, it was more material and of a national character, which means they were talking about a kingdom of God of Israel that was materialistic in a sense or in character, and it was a nationalistic in character at the same time. Christ publicly announced that next Messiah, whom the Jews were expecting, was not a Jew or a son of David, but a son of Ishmael, whose name was Ahmed, and that he would establish the kingdom of God upon earth with the power of the word of God and the sword. Mm. And that's really twisting the teaching of the Bible in the Old and the New Testament, in the Torah and in the Gospel. Jesus never, and I've been studying the Bible for over 50 years, Jesus Christ never mentioned that a prophet will come at some point after him who would be called Ahmed and he would be the Messiah of the people. Actually, the Messiah that the Jews were expecting was Jesus Christ. And the word Christ means the one who is anointed. Even the Quran itself calls Jesus the anointed one. And it never called Muhammad the anointed one. So our Muslim friends are leaving the Quran and the Hadith on the side and they are grabbing the Torah and the uh, Gospel and try to apply them to Muhammad so they can be on the same footage with Christianity. Mm. 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 And that is not acceptable. If they don't have any answer to our questions or to our defense, then they should accept what we say and not try, try to sneak in and take over our expressions and theology and apply it to their religion. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Rishon. Well, uh, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Let me turn down my audio. I think I'm giving you some feedback there. But I have a lot of thoughts there you just brought up. I mean, when did uh, Muhammad share uh, the parables of the kingdom and, and Muhammad's going to go on a long journey and, and deliver, you know, some dates to certain uh, three servants and, uh, you know, come back and take an account, you know, whatever, you know, you don't have that. Or uh, <laughs> when, when did, you know, when did Muhammad, uh, you know, say um, uh, before, oh, I don't know, uh, the, the woman who poisoned him of, of Khaybar, you know, uh, thou has said, that, that I'm the prophet. And nevertheless, I send you hereafter, shall you see Muhammad sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. But Jesus says this, and, and he's referring to that passage in Daniel when, when he's before the high priest, you know, hereafter you will see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. And the high priest, verse 65 of Matthew 26, then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, he's spoken blasphemy about the Muslim prophet Muhammad. No, <laughs> he's spoken blasphemy about himself claiming to be the divine Messiah. Yeah. And so as you say, Pastor Wissam, Muslim apologists are wanting us to believe that Muslims in the 21st century spending too much time on the Internet are better able to understand what Jesus was talking about than the Jewish scholars, the most religious and most trained uh, Jewish scribes uh, who were there listening to him, observing him, his actions, his words, the complete context in Hebrew, listening to what he said. And they immediately knew that he was claiming to be that divine son of man who's going to come in the clouds in heaven uh, from Daniel 7. Lord have mercy. Lord Daddy. have mercy. Brother Osama, I yeah. know you're chomping at the bit to speak, and then we'll get back to... Amen. Amen. Here's the deal. 
one of the signs or one of the mark for a cult is the change of the theology. Yeah. If you want to know a cult, it's very simple. See what they teach about any subject and wait for five or ten years and see what they teach about the same subject. The longer you wait, the more they change their theology about the same subject. I remember 30 years ago or so, uh, Ahmed Didat, one of the considered by Muslims to be a great theologian, he actually used that passage when Jesus says he's the son of man, he's the son of man, he's the son of man, to mock the idea that Jesus is the son of God. He said, Jesus himself, listen to his own word as he speaks. Jesus says he's the son of man, he's not the son of God. That's how the best Ahmed Didat and the theologians and the apologists of his uh, days can come up with from the Bible to prove that Jesus is not the Son of God because he said he's the Son of Man. Hmm. Now the Muslims are using the same passage, Son of Man, to point to Muhammad to be that anointed one. Of course not. You cannot do that. And as you said, Brother Joseph, and I love it, I'm glad you mentioned it because I'm sitting here listening to Pastor Sam and I'm, I'm my man, man. I want to get into it. When Jesus quoted that, I, what is written in Daniel 7, the high priest did not say, oh, thank you so much. Now we know you are just a son of man. No. <laughs> he actually want to stone him. He didn't want to kill him because yeah. he, while he is a man, claimed to be the son of man. What son of man? The one who have eternity. The one who have no beginning, have no end. That is the son of man. How in the world? See, my, my, the problem of, of our dear Muslim friends, the new theologians, they have no idea what they're talking about. Have they investigated Daniel 7 to know exactly what the scripture meant by the son of man? They will never call Muhammad son of man because now the son of Muhammad is God. Yeah. He's eternal. Of yeah. course, that does not work. Anyway, I yeah. want to go back to, um, uh, uh, let me just get another minute if you don't mind. I want to talk to you about the, 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 the teaching of Muhammad and the teaching of uh, our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ concerning the good work which by it you will qualify to get to that kingdom. Amen. The, the earthly kingdom of Muhammad or the eternal kingdom according to our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now, Muhammad tells the Muslims that good works will erase sin. As if, uh, as if God in the Bible said yeah. the wages of sin is good work. Well, obviously, that is a huge error. That is a big theological error. Muhammad did not have a clue, nor Allah or Jibreel, the real measurement of God and the justice of God concerning sin. The wage of sin is death from the beginning. When God talked to Adam and Eve, he said, don't eat from that tree. From the, tree. the day you eat from it, you will dead die. Mount and Tamut in Arabic, for sure you're going to die. He did not say, well, you eat from the tree, we just do some good work and everything will be fine. Yeah. And Allah in the Quran, when he quoted that story, obviously a corrupted way, he said that Allah gave Muhammad, uh, give Adam some words. And because Adam repeated these words, he received forgiveness. For he said, no, no, my friends, the wages of sin is death. And the Bible is very clear, Old Testament, New Testament, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Somebody mm -hmm. has to die. Yes. In the Old Testament, they offer the sacrifice of pure animals as a picture to the true sacrifice of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But listen to what Allah said in Quran chapter 11 and verse 114. It says, surely, <laughs> it's not maybe, now, now Allah knows for sure, so that's for certain. Surely good deeds drive away the evil deeds. I'm sorry. This is false teaching. This is false theology. And if you think by doing good work, you'll be able to make it to paradise and you get to the kingdom of Islam or the eternity, of, uh, which is every Muslim are hoping for, but they don't know it, as we mentioned earlier. This is false teaching. That will not lead you to the kingdom of God, but that will lead you to the eternity of Muhammad. That is a place is called hell. If we have time, I will talk a little bit about it later. But here is quickly in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Just to compare the teaching of Muhammad to the teaching of the Bible. The Bible said, for by grace are ye saved through faith. It is not Sorry, it is the gift of God, not of work, so no one should boast. So how we receive forgiveness, it's not by doing good work, it is we receive forgiveness by grace. God riches at Christ's expense. Christ pays for our sin. 
the greatest gift which we can get from heaven is the forgiveness of our sins that we can secure our eternity. How? By trusting in Christ and Christ alone, the one who died. Because once again, the wages of sin is death, not good work. Amen. Thank you, Brother Joseph. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Osama. And you know, uh, that reminds me to share with our viewers this idea, uh, the satanic counterfeit, this false teaching. They are right. Someone has to die. Uh, but they've got it wrong. It's not the Muslim who hates the Jew or the Christian uh, with, with such murderous hatred that they die fighting against the infidel and somehow gain heaven. But God himself in his love and mercy and grace, Natma, he comes down uh, and gives himself for all who would believe as Amen. the perfect sinless lamb of God. And as you're pointing out here, uh, these jihadists, you know, this false doctrine, you know, some of these jihadists, they go to the... Uh, the uh, what do you call it? The gentleman's club, and and they do all these sins and everything else the night before they go and kill themselves. Uh, and somehow they think, hey, you know, have fun, do all this stuff. Uh, as soon as I die as a martyr, I, I'm forgiven. Forgiveness. And quite frankly, uh, as as some of you have already uh, mentioned, uh, once they die, they think they're going to go back to the gentleman's club for eternity. <laughs> the seventy-two uh, hori, but uh, we know that's not true. Uh, Brother Gary, I know you've been listening and you've got a lot to say and uh, you share as, as you're led. But there's one thing that stuck out to me here. In Islam, entering the kingdom is is a work, is a work. And, and, and it has to do with with pride and and valor and and even even fighting physically with might and main for Allah. Uh, but in Christianity, I, I think it's very different. You may want to address that or another aspect of the kingdom of God in Christianity. Well, we, um, we are saved by grace, but I believe there is a deeper meaning of grace than what we've traditionally considered. Obviously, um, we, are, we are saved um, even though we're not worthy at the process. And so we're just, again, at uh, that old terminology of the poor old sinner saved by grace. But in studying grace, it becomes much more powerful when we view it as the authority of the very God of creation entitled to us as believers. In fact, in scripture, in the book of Esther, it's a very interesting allegory, um, interesting book itself, where in the Dead Sea Scrolls discovery in 1947, all texts of the Old Testament, at least remnants of the Bible, were found in the caves of Qum Qumran, except the book of Esther. And that literally forced me to ponder is the absence of that book from the Dead Sea Scrolls trying to speak? And I studied uh, a little bit on the early church, and they considered Esther to not be canon because it didn't mention Jehovah, it didn't mention the temple. And yet the symbol of, the, of it is a king, in this case the king of Persia, um, was going to take a new wife, Esther, um, and she was invited to the inner courts of the king, and she, in the process of learning of a edict from that king to kill all the Jews, she had to decide if she would tell him that she herself was a Jew. Hmm. Well, the the symbolism of it was when she told the king, when she self-sacrificed to the king, to her own possible execution, he actually turned the tide on Haman, who prepared to kill all the Jews, and gave her the signet ring, which mm. is called in Hebrew uh, a seal or a signet ring, which bore the name of the king in ancient Persia, the authority of the king 
was transferred when you received that seal and no one could open the document that was sealed. Well, in Revelation it says, who's worthy to open the seal? Mm -hmm. The lamb of the tribe of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah and, and the lamb were mm -hmm. worthy to open the seal. So that the seal becomes the authority of the king entitled to a believer who goes before the king in humility and self-sacrifice um, and it turns the tide on the enemy. And I believe that's a picture of the overcoming believer entering into the inner courts of the king Symbolically, there is no tabernacle in Revelation. There's no longer the need of it. It's now a spiritual house, which Jesus says the head and believers as lively stones jointly mm -hmm. fit together, building up the temp new temple of God. Praise God. Well, thank you, Brother Gay, for bringing that up. I, we have a few minutes before the break, and I'd like to go to Pastor Wissam. Pastor Wissam, uh, this idea of authority that uh, Brother Gary has broached concerning the kingdom. Uh, you know, as, as Christians, we go forth, you know, Jesus says, all authority uh, in heaven and earth has been given unto me, now therefore you go. And there seems to be a very clear implication that uh, now as believers in the name of Jesus, we go in his name, in his authority. And we look in First John, the idea, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so we have this derived authority through the grace of God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, this spiritual authority on the earth, do you see this? Uh, is there anything comparable in Islam? Uh, or do you think perhaps this might be another reason for the inferiority complex of Muslims concerning uh, these comparisons of the kingdom? Yeah, actually, there is some similarities between, you know, between Islam and Christianity concerning uh, the call to uh, be a missionary and to go all over the world and uh, to spread Islam like we spread Christianity. Mm. But the idea that uh, Christ has all authority in heaven on earth does not apply to Muslims because Muhammad does not have that authority. Right. So they are doing what they are doing to spread Islam either by lying or by the sword, or by uh, like giving people money, or by deceiving people into becoming Muslims by attacking other religions in unfairly way. So what we see here is that uh, among Christians, we have the power and the presence of God in our life. And the gospel that God gave us is not the gospel of violence, it must, it's not the gospel of deceit, it's not the gospel of lies, but it is the gospel of truth based on historical facts and on experiential facts that millions of people have experienced in their life the power of God to save us through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ as the core of the kingdom of God. I believe the message of the kingdom of God has been built on that core idea, which is Christ as Lord being crucified and raised from the dead on the third day. That's the core of our belief as Christians. And there is no powerful message uh, more powerful than what we have, you know, which is Christ in us, who is living in us and who is spreading that message of reconciliation among the people. Amen. So what I would say to our brother uh, and sisters uh, who are Muslims, that they should go back to their teachings and read their Quran and read their Hadith and try to figure out that there are so much, there is a huge gap between what the Quran and the Hadith is telling them and what traditions tradition is telling them. Because what we see in tradition is very different in so many ways uh, from what the Quran and the Hadith are telling us. Mm. 
And here I would tell our brothers and sisters uh, who are Muslims that uh, they believe that the kingdom of God is the religion of Islam. Yeah. And believe they believe that God is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And they are worshiping that God. But in reality, without them knowing, they are worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible tells us in the Gospel in Revelation chapter 19 and 16 that on his side was that those names, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Mm. Even if they don't comprehend and they don't know and they have no knowledge and they are ignorant of that fact, in reality, they are worshiping that God, as Paul said to the people in Athens when he was, you know, roaming around the city. And he said, you know, I found that you were very religious and I found out that you have a, a an altar uh, that is written on it uh, to a unknown God. Yeah. That unknown God, you are worshiping, guys. And our Muslims, uh, Muslim friends, are worshiping the Lord Jesus if they are worshiping the Lord of Lord and uh, the King of Kings. At the same time, I would say to our Muslim friends that they have longing in their hearts to have fellowship with God. Yeah. Because Islam has dead precepts. Islam does not have life. Islam has death in it. That's mm. why the people in Islam are empty. They are struggling. They don't see any light. They have no hope. Mm. And that's why the idea of, uh, uh, of those people who came out of Islam, you know what we call the Sufis. The yeah. Sufis came out of Islam because they found out that Islam was a dead religion. Mm. And they wanted to have fellowship with God. They wanted to be close to God, to feel his presence, to feel his love, his mercy, compassion. And that's why they initiated that kind of a sect among Muslims. Right. And I would say to our Muslim friends that the only way to have fellowship with God and enjoy him and have his presence among us and share in his love and his salvation and have eternal life is through the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Amen. He Amen. said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can come to the Father but through me. Amen. He is your hope as he is our hope. And in Great. Christ, you can find that hope of forgiveness of sins, regeneration, and eternal life. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, they pray every day. Uh, uh, well, Yeshua, Yeshua al-Masih, who al-Sirat al mustaqim yeah. He Amen. is the straight way. They're praying for Allah to guide them to the straight way. Well, as the name of uh, Brother Osama's ministry, the straight way, this is, of course, Jesus Christ and him alone. We're going to come back after a break, and I'm going to challenge our guests on uh, Matthew 18, the first uh, five verses concerning who it is that gets to enter into the kingdom of, of God and the kingdom of heaven and Christianity and how that compares to the prerequisites, if you will, of entering in uh, to the kingdom of Islam. We have a lot more to talk about. We are live and we're looking forward to you viewers joining us for the last half hour after this short break. Join Trinity Channel Wednesday, May 28th for the next installment of our Jesus or Muhammad Marathon. Join us at 6 p.m. for a special program with host Asad Faraj and guests Anthony Rogers and Dr. Tim Roll. And then join us once again at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a show on women in Christianity versus women in Islam with host Matt Slick and guests Laura Powell, Brother Ahmed Paul, and Dr. Tim Roll. Only on Trinity Channel. Thank you for watching Trinity Channel and supporting AVN Sat TV ministry. You can further support this ministry through social media. 
Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Trinity Channel and click on our page. From there, like, follow, and share our page on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel while clicking on the bell icon to the right to receive notifications on new videos that we will post to the channel each week. Most importantly, after watching a video on these sites, use the comment section to give your thoughts about the program. Continue to support this ministry by following us on social media. You are watching Trinity Channel. Praise the Lord and welcome back to the Jesus or Muhammad Marathon, our second night here. We're talking about the kingdom of God in Christianity and uh, something like that, or at least a counterfeit of it in Islam, the false kingdom of God in Islam. We have three wonderful guests that have been bringing out some excellent points and insights. And uh, thank you, dear viewers, for watching. We love to hear from you. Remember, uh, we need your support to stay on the air, both through the Internet and also our uh, satellite broadcast to the Middle East, yes, and to the Far East, uh, sharing Christ with people all over the world and Muslims in particular. Well, right now, we want to get back to our topic in the last 25 minutes of our program. And I challenged our uh, three guests, uh, and I'm going to do it now with the first few verses of Matthew chapter 18. Let's take a look at the first few verses. Matthew chapter 18, beginning verse 1, there's a question about the kingdom. That is the prerequisites. Who's going to enter the kingdom according to Jesus? At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, uh, it would be interesting to compare this with who is the greatest in the ummah. Well, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus, he called Muhammad? No. Jesus, he called Peter? No. Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child my name receiveth me. Brothers, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. I would just like to say one thing before I uh, let you uh, have a chance with this uh, topic. My, uh, my many visits to the Middle East and being with my Muslim family in the Middle East, uh, I know one thing for sure, and that is that pride is a big deal in the Islamic culture. And that the religion of Islam has a great deal of pride. But in Christianity, humility is the virtue. And we see that Jesus says, if you want to enter the kingdom, you have to become like a little child. I'd like to uh, turn to our uh, guests now and see what you have to say on this topic. How does this uh, line up? Brother Osama, real quickly, um, when you tell a Muslim, mm -hmm. hey, if you want to be a, a real spiritual person, you've got to be humble like a little child. Uh, is that something that, that jives and connects with uh, Muslim theology and teaching? Sadly, the, the, the opposite is true when it comes to Islam, when it comes to the teacher of Muhammad, when it comes to the Sunnah of Muhammad. You skipped the following verse. I do not know why you did not read verse 6. Because ahead, verse 6 is so powerful. It says here, but who shall offend one of these little ones which believes in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Muhammad, in his life, he did the opposite. When he offended Aisha, the little child, the six mm. years old, I mean, hello, my friends. We know the tree from the fruit. We, we can talk about Muhammad. We can talk about Christ and the kingdom of, of Christ, the kingdom of God, and the hogwash teaching of Muhammad throughout the Quran and the Hadith. But let us see the action of Muhammad. Jesus brought a child, and he said, you have to be humble. You have to come to accept the kingdom of God like a child with a sincere heart, with a soft heart. 
And that is the only way for anyone to accept Christ. If you want to accept the Christian faith and you use your uh, your intelligence, you use your skills, and you use your, your availability and all the good things, so all your degrees, you will never see the kingdom of God. You need to come to Christ as a child, as a babe who believe, who trust, who submit, who surrender to that loving great father and the great sacrifice which was offered through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. But the opposite is true. Muhammad did not tell them that, and he actually lived the opposite. He offended Aisha. Mm -hmm. A Muslim who cannot see how evil and how wicked Muhammad were offended that little girl, six years old, whom he literally enjoyed sexually full intercourse when she was nine. Mm -hmm. And he continued to do that until he died when she was 18. That Muhammad, it will be better for him to have a millstone around his neck, to be drowned under the water, never to float in the top of the water again, because that is a reality. The kingdom of Muhammad, the teaching of Muhammad concerning eternity, have no truth whatsoever. And the kingdom of Christ, learn it from his teaching. He is the perfect Ghulam and Zakiyan. He is Wajihan Fidunya of Akhir. He has no guilt, no sin whatsoever. Compare that Lord and Savior to that sinful, evil Muhammad, the child molester, the sex offender, the prophet pretender, the womanizer, the adulterer, the thief, the thug, the terrorist, Muhammad will not lead anyone to any kingdom, but to eternity in hell. And I wish we have another hour to talk about that, but of course I need to let the uh, time go to other uh, dear brothers to share with you. Thank you, Brother Joseph. Thank you, Brother Osama. I'm gonna go to Brother uh, Gary in just a moment, but uh, I just wanna mention, when you said that, uh, you know, you think about Muhammad, uh, he took, you know, this doesn't seem to be his original given name, uh, more a name that he took upon himself. And for those who don't know uh, Arabic, essentially Muhammad means the praised one, the one who is praised, hummed. And, uh, and it's interesting, as uh, Pastor Wissam mentioned, that they're trying to read Muhammad back into uh, the Son of Man passages. Jesus didn't come saying, hey, hey, I'm the praised one. Praise me. Uh, he says, I'm the Son of Man. Now, now, he does say he's the Son of God, but he uses Son of Man more. Jesus humbles himself. Jesus says, look, I didn't come to be served. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. But Muhammad is very different. Muhammad, who is nothing, tries to exalt himself. Jesus, who is the God of creation, humbles himself. And the Bible clearly teaches he who humbles himself will be exalted. He who exalts himself will be abased. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus Christ humbled himself and now he's exalted to the right hand of the most high God. Muhammad exalted himself and now he is abased. He is dead. His bones in Medina, his soul in hell. And Muslims, we pray that you will follow the true son of man and Messiah, yeah. son of God, king of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, our savior. And we pray yours. Amen. Amen. Brother Gary, uh, you've been mentioning more than once here. I can tell a theme running in, in, in your mind of, um, of the authority of the believer, as well as the maturity of the believer. And, and these are wonderful concepts. How do you see this, the paradox of these truths of the authority of the believer of the maturity of the christian believer along with the idea that to enter into the kingdom jesus says hey to enter in you have to kind of do the reverse you have to humble yourself as a little child how do you see this uh, with your understanding of the kingdom in the word of god well there's a uh, a great contrast between the example and words of jesus and of the Quran uh, in reference to Muhammad um, going to the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, it says, Blessed is the poor in spirit, for yeah. theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, poor in spirit, of course, implies humility. And it goes on to say, Blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, um, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. While well, you contrast that with Muhammad's uh, attitude about dealing with enemies, where Jesus said, love your enemies, mm. 
there's a a verse in the in the Quran that says retaliation is prescribed for you. Mm -hmm. And it in studying of history, which Islam tends to ignore um, a legitimate discussion of historical facts. Mm -hmm. And um, when you deny that the temple in Jerusalem ever existed, which even Hamas does today, and they claim to drive Israel into the sea, and there never was a temple on that site. Well, when you move that temple, which Philo of Josephus and, and Josephus, two first century historians said, the temple gathered literally millions from all over the known world at the three annual feasts. And it's well documented. And, it, and they say, one quote from Philo says that the, the temple was beautiful beyond description. And then you contrast that with the Kaaba and so-called temple in Mecca, and there's no historical basis. Mm. In fact, there's fables associated with its, with its um, uh, construction. Abraham and Ishmael supposedly removed the idols out of the old ancient black rock stone Kaaba and purified it in some way. Well, number one, Abraham was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. Um, you would think there'd be a historical record of an 800 mile journey with his son Ishmael across the desert to Mecca. Um, and then there's the story of the winged horse where Muhammad tied them up at the temple and claimed he went to heaven from the side of the temple mount. So it's, it's reason is absent in their theology. Mm. And um, I found that uh, that's part of the plan. I read a book called Milestones by Syed Kadab, and I'm sure these gentlemen know that. Sayed, Sayed Kutub. Yeah. Sayed Kutub, yeah. yeah. But he, he actually, and some people say he, uh, his book was a Bible of uh, fundamentalist Islam. And he said that we can't debate or use reason against the words of Allah. So you can't even get a historical basis or debate when you're dealing with fables. Mm. And um, anyway, in terms of back to that uh, scripture about coming like a child, Jesus was not weak. He was meek, but the meaning of that is power under control. So he had authority, he had power, but he chose to humble himself. And of course, we are in that same uh, category of decision. Do we retaliate or do we love our enemies? Amen. Very good, Brother Gary. Well, and we think about time and time again, uh, the Lord uses uh, the weak to confound the mighty, the foolish to confound the wise. As the Apostle Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. We think of Gideon. Uh, Gideon didn't have, uh, you know, a too uh, few men when he first had 32,000. Uh, he had too many. <laughs> and God wasn't going to give the victory till he brought it down to 300 so that he might get the glory. But as uh, Brother Osama mentioned in Islam, it's all about uh, the, the individual Muslim getting the glory and, and ultimately Muhammad, who is less than God. Uh, what a shame. Well, brothers, in a little bit of time left, I want to talk more now, finally, about the consummation. We talk about the kingdom, the consummation, the idea of uh, the end. Now, the second coming of Christ, the Bible kind of gives us an idea of what takes place. In Islam, it's a little bit more difficult to track down. We know the Shia and the Sunni have a little bit different idea of the end times. But uh, either Brother Osama or, or Pastor um, Wissam, 
either one of you, would you like to uh, take a stab at, at trying to give our viewers maybe a, a, a overview of a contrast of when Muhammad comes back or even when Jesus comes back in Islam, what he's going to do in Islam versus what he's going to do in Christianity, this consummation or inauguration of this eternal kingdom, this idea in Islam and Christianity, many have said are almost diametrically opposed. Would either one of you like to talk about that? Go ahead, Pastor. No, go ahead, please. Okay. All right. Well, in, in, according to Islam, according to Islam, when Christ come back, he will, uh, of course, because he believed he didn't die. He ascended to heaven, escaped from the window in the upper room. But he no. went there. That's okay. When he comes back, he will be a good Muslim. He will have four wives. He, he, he will worship as a Muslim. He will lead the people to Islam. He will kill the pigs, which means he will get rid of Judaism. And he will break the cross, which means he will get rid of Christianity. And the whole world will be a Muslim world. And we, but the beauty is he will have four wives. Uh, as I said earlier in our program, I only have one wife. But when Jesus comes back, he'll have four wives. And uh, and that is will bring to the, come up to the end. By the way, according to Muhammad himself, everything that lives will die. So Jesus will die, yes. Uh, all the people will die, yes. The angels will die, yes. Even the eight angels which carry the throne of Allah will die. So the throne of Allah will be hanging in the air. Nobody's going to carry his throne. He'll be sitting on his throne hanging in the air. But anyway, and, and that's when Isa, son of Mary, will die. Everybody will die. So obviously, it's a weird teaching. It is a, it is a cult. Uh, we do not have any uh, support of it from the biblical teaching, Old Testament, New Testament. As we know from the scripture, when Jesus comes back, it will be the blink of an eye. It will be that quick. We're not talking about uh, having four wives and on and on with all these lies of Muhammad and Muslim scholars. And when he comes, he will not come as a savior, but he will come as a judge, just judge. For all those who will not accept Christ now, they will bow down, my dear friends. Listen, my dear Muslims, you will bow down. Every knee will bow down and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's how we know that eternity is going to be. But sadly, for those who will bow down to Jesus on that day of judgment when he comes back, who did not bow down to him here, who did not confess him as Lord and Savior here, they will bow down and they will be sent to the lake of fire. They'll be sent to hell forever. And I know, I know, that's not what Muslims believe. I know Muslim believes that uh, it is Allah's will. He chose for some to make it to paradise or not. But believe me, Allah's will is not for people to be uh, accepted, to be uh, delivered from sin. Here's what Allah said in Quran, chapter 32, verse 13. And if we had will, we had surely given to every soul its guidance, but the word which had gone forth from me was established. I will surely fill hell with jinn and people together. These are the words of Allah in Quran, chapter 32, verse 13. My friends, don't waste your eternity in hell. Don't believe in the lies of Muhammad. He is not the praised one. His real name is Qasim. That's his real name. He named himself the praised one. And no one should ever be named Muhammad or Ahmed because these are the one who is worthy to be praised. That is Jesus Christ alone. He is worthy of our uh, thanks, of our worship and our praise. And the, uh, the will of Allah, not for one person to be saved, to be delivered, but his will, as he said, Quran 32, 13, he will that every soul human and jinn will burn in hell. I'm sorry, that's not a God I will worship or I will follow. Thank you, Pastor Osama. We have about seven minutes left in our program. I want to go to Pastor Wissam and then end with Brother Gary. Pastor Wissam, Brother Gary, uh, as you uh, summarize uh, and especially perhaps talk about the end goal of the kingdom of Christ versus the end goal of the kingdom of Islam, uh, perhaps also you can give a word of invitation especially to those who have not yet entered the kingdom of God. Pastor Wissam mm -hmm. first. Yeah, what distinguishes the kingdom of Christ from the kingdom of Islam uh, is that in the kingdom of Christ, we have a hope, an eternal hope, that we are saved through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross because he bore on himself our sins 
and he paid the penalty for our sins. And because we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior, he Amen. guaranteed us that one day we will be in the kingdom of God through eternity. Amen. While in Islam, there is no hope. There is only despair. There is wishful thinking. There is a weight on uh, what we call the Qadr. Mm. Even they say, you know, we are waiting on God's uh, mercy, but the mercy of God for them is not assured. You know, the mercy of God depends on God's mood. Right. If he is in the mood to forgive them, he would forgive them. If he's not in the mood, then he would not do that. While in Christianity, there is that assurance that when we accept the Lord Jesus as our Lord and Savior in our life, the Holy Spirit would come inside of us, regenerates us, and gives us a new identity, a new okay. being in us that has the assurance of salvation at one day. And that's the aim of the kingdom of God. You know, the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. It's not about uh, gaining money and fighting. The kingdom of God, according to the Bible, is about peace, righteousness, and joy. Amen. And Amen. that's what is the presence of God that God has called us to. It's not like the paradise or the Jannah of Islam, mm -hmm. where people would have 72 uh, like uh, mermaids and uh, young uh, boys and drinking from uh, rivers of wine. This is not the presence of God. The presence of God is made up of peace, holiness, love, righteousness, holiness, holiness Amen. and uh, uh, joy. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Wissam. And you, know, you wonder, what is there to entice women to go to the Islamic heaven? Not yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. Yeah, Brother Gary, we only have like three minutes left. Perhaps you could sum up by God's uh, help, because I know you have so much to say, uh, your last comment on the kingdom and perhaps also an invitation to folks to enter into that kingdom. Amen. Well, I think that the message of the kingdom has to begin with, is with the nation of Israel mm -hmm. as a pattern and as a schoolmaster to teach us Jesus and Amen. to progress us into the kingdom. And I referenced the book of Esther where Esther, let's say she's a type of the church who received in the inner courts of the king the full authority and of the king to free her fellow Jews. And I just want to quote Esther 8 as a challenge to the church okay. to become all that we can be. And this is what took place after the Jews were freed by the authority of the king through Esther and or Mordecai. It says in Esther 8, for the, for the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor, in every province and in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with fasting and celebrating. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because of what they saw. Amen. I just pray that the church will manifest that overcoming joy with the grace and entitlement of the authority we're given as believers under the head Jesus, who is our king. And yet we serve him out of sonship or as a daughter. And ultimately, corporately, we serve him as with full intimacy of a bride of Christ. That's the message to me of the kingdom, the potential that we have. And when we sh show that joy to the first to the Jew, they will be jealous for what they see in us. And all nations will come to Zion, which is a Amen. people 
more than a place. Mm -hmm. Well said. Thank you, Brother Gary. Thank you, Pastor Wissam and Pastor Usama. Uh, viewers, if you've been blessed and you'd like to find out more about these men's ministries respectively, please contact us. You can email us. You can contact us. The uh, methods are on the screen. And uh, especially I know that uh, Brother Gary has uh, published a couple of books and his latest one, if you'd like to get a copy of that. Uh, the title again of your latest book, Brother Gary? It's The Last Seal of the King. It's on Amazon and uh, it was just published, but it uh, addresses some of the shaking that's been going on in the world just prior to the election, um, which added shaking. <laughs> and, right. uh, but it, it's uh, basically the message is what cannot be shaking is, shaken is the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Well, I'm interested in reading it. I'm sure others are as well. Also, to find out more about Brother Osama's ministry, thestraightway.org. And uh, if you'd like to get in contact with Pastor Wissam, you've seen the contact information on the screen. Brothers, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. I thank God for your insight. I thank God for your time. And we pray as we have that this program, not only live, but in the future on the Internet, will continue to be used by the Lord to produce fruit for his glory. Thank you for discussing this important topic. And dear viewers, thank you so much for watching. Of course, the Jesus or Muhammad Marathon continues all through the rest of the week. Uh, continue to stay tuned to see the schedule of wonderful programs coming in the future. Until then, I say to you all, good night and God bless. And God bless you. God bless. Thank you. Trinity Channel Wednesday, May 28th for the next installment of our Jesus or Muhammad Marathon. Join us at 6 p.m. for a special program with host Asad Faraj and guests Anthony Rogers and Dr. Tim Roll. And then join us once again at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a show on women in Christianity versus women in Islam with host Matt Slick and guests Laura Powell, Brother Ahmed Paul, and Dr. Tim Roll. Only on Trinity Channel. Dear Trinity Channel and ABN viewers, coming soon, Jesus or Muhammad, our upcoming apologetics marathon, starts on Monday, May the 24th through Friday, May the 28th. Join us live and online on a week of Christian apologetics for two shows per day, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And again, from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, only on Trinity Channel and ABN. We are looking forward to having many of your favorite guests back on our screens. A great group of apologetics professionals including Dr. Larry Helms, Noni Darwish, Dr. Daniel Janosik, Dr. Jay Smith, Laura Powell, Pastor Joseph, Walid Shobat, Dr. Tony Costa, Ahmed Pohl, Anthony Rogers, Dave Agama, Osama Dagduk, Dr. Gary Cobb, and Dr. Tim Rojo, and many more. For more information, visit our websites www.abnsat.com and www.trinitychannel.com You can also call us on 248-416-1300「We are looking forward to seeing you join us for the whole week from Monday through Friday so we can learn together and participate in sharing the truth with the world. May God bless you richly. »